got all five people muted. It was a very quiet meeting. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the April 21st edition of the WAS Westport Astronomical Society monthly meeting. Uh, we have a, our usual panel of experts uh, joining us tonight, uh, including uh, Moshe Guy from uh, UConn and uh, Cal Hudson from somewhere else. Hi, everybody. DC. Welcome to the April uh, 21st. And uh, that was an interesting audio problem. <laughs> uh, 20 seconds in, we have a technical glitch. <laughs> I know what. No? Well, we'll figure that out. Anyway, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon uh, in a second, just to let you know uh, we're all, you know, if you're watching us, you're on YouTube. Uh, if you have some uh, chat uh, or you'd like to post in the, the uh, column there, or any questions, uh, we'll be reading that and we'll be able to address those during the, uh, during the meeting. So uh, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll have a good meeting. I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon now. So Shannon, go for it. I think I was on uh, mute. Alex muzzled me. 
Uh, this is another virtual meeting. Unfortunately, we can't get everybody uh, together in the classroom. So we're gonna have our whole crowd, both of you online. So I think we will start off with Mr. Cal Powell down in DC area. Take it away, Cal. And remember you're on mute. Okay, I'm unmuted now, great. Let me share my screen and share. And almost live from just south of the district, again, another installment of Cal's Corner. And uh, since I couldn't be with you today to talk about meteorites, I decided to have a sort of a briefer session on uh, meteorite relatives, namely some tektites. And I'll start with my normal little bit of humor. So tektites, these are glassy terrestrial debris from meteorite impacts. They are composed mostly of silica, more than 65%, and have virtually no water content, less than two hundredths of a percent. And they are completely glassy, which means that they don't have any uh, significant inclusions of other crystals or uh, minerals. And compared to terrestrial volcanic glasses, they're more closely related to sedimentary rocks than our uh, terrestrial volcanic glasses are. Uh, they are grouped by where they are found, which is the strewn field associated with the impact site. And most of them are uh, in these four strewn fields. The oldest one is the North American strewn field, which is the impact crater is actually under the southern part of Chesapeake Bay. The Central European uh, strewn field, the impact crater there is in uh, Bavaria in Germany. The Ivory Coast strewn field and the impact crater there is in uh, the neighboring Ghana. And the strewn field or the uh, tektites I'll be talking about uh, today, the Australasian strewn field. And uh, this one is a, a very interesting and diverse strewn field. Tektites are also classed by physical form. So that there are the most of them are what we call splash form or normal tektites. And those are the ones you see pictured there. There are aerodynamically shaped or button tektites. We'll see uh, an example of that a little bit later. There are the layered or muang nang tektites. We'll see one of those later. And finally, there are the micro tektites, which are small and very small and have a number of uh, interesting shapes. Here is a diagram roughly showing uh, in, in a very condensed form how uh, tektites are formed based on an impact. And so you can look this uh, diagram up on uh, Google and uh, get a, a very good understanding of how impacts, how tektites are formed and shaped. The Australasian ones, uh, these are the largest strewn field. It extends from southern China to Australia, has the greatest variation in shape and size. And the impact is dated between 770,000 to 790,000 years ago. And the impact site uh, was under debate, but it may be settled by a, a very recent discovery. So there is an image of the strewn field, and you can see how uh, wide ranging it is. The uh, darker orange is where uh, samples have been recovered. And this shows the 
area where it's believed that the crater is. Apparently it's in a place called uh, the Bolivin Plateau in southern Laos. And it's been hard to find because it's an area that's covered by a lava flow. But uh, more studies will be uh, undertaken to uh, verify that. So these uh, Australasian tectites are three basic types. They're Indochinites, which are from Southeast Asia and China. Philippinites, which are from the Philippines. And Australites, which are from Australia. And there you see a good example of a button or aerodynamic tectite. So this is a, a Muang Nang uh, tectite it's from my collection. And I usually uh, have my specimens uh, photographed in between uh, Georgie and Frankie here to give you a sense of size. And uh, as you can see, it's got a chip on it. So you can see the glassy composition underneath. And you can also get a sense that this is a kind of layered uh, tectite. And it's a kind of a blobby layered tectites, and these are the largest ones in size. Uh, Muang Nang is an area in Laos, and so that's where these get their names from. Here are two Indochinites. Uh, the top one is a, uh, a sort of a dog bone shape or dumbbell shape. And it was, it's probably got that shape as it helicoptered through the air while it was uh, solidifying. That one was found in southern China. The one below it, not quite as stretched out, is a uh, Indochinite from Thailand. This is a type of uh, Filipinite called a, a Bicolite uh, from the Bicol area of the Philippines. It's a bit more rounded. And it's also a bit farther, found a bit farther away from the impact site. And this is the front and back of an Australite. Again, uh, these are all from my collection. And you can see the uh, flow ridges on the top image, those circular uh, raised portions, as well as a, a slight bit of uh, flange on the bottom image. And so the flow ridges are on the leading edge and the flange is on the trailing edge. So you can tell which direction it flew in as it was solidifying. And here is a diagram that shows the detailed structure of an Australite button tectite. So that's a brief guide to tectites, especially uh, Austra. Australasian tectites. And so for more information, I recommend the Wikipedia tectite page and also the Jackson School Museum of Earth History's uh, tectite page. They have a pretty good one as well. So now I don't always self-isolate, but when I do, it's because of the coronavirus. So stay healthy, my friends. And I'll be back with you remotely next month. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. That was really cool. Um, I have a little bit of an interest in tectite, so that was uh, interesting, if brief. Um, so anyways, back to our normal, hang on. There we go. Yeah. Ah, back to our normal game here. Um, up next is Bob, and yes, that is very similar to the same slide I used last month because I'm lazy. <laughs> but we'll bring up Bob, who's going to talk about how we're basically not open. <laughs> so take it away, Bob. Okay, due to the uh, coronavirus risk, the Bessier Marathon, public nights, and special groups were canceled effective March 18th. Uh, because our new Celestron 14 inch telescope is on a German equatorial mount. There's a counterweight. There are four weights on an 18 inch bar. A shorter bar would be less of a hazard and be easier to maneuver around. We have a nine inch bar we could put in in place of the 18 inch bar, but it only has room for three weights. 
to balance the telescope with only three weights, we would have to replace one 18 pound weight with a weight of at least 60 pounds. Mike Mizakevich is going to make a weight that will work with the shorter bar, but for now, the scrap metal place is closed so he can't get the material. With the old telescope, you sometimes had to get down very low near the pier to view. The new pier is higher, but it's too high with the eyepiece as high as six feet, seven inches. Carl Lancaster has made a new top section for the pier that will lower it by eight inches. He prepared the steel parts and Mike Mizakevich welded them together. It's ready to be installed when the virus risk drops. Kevin Green has been doing asteroid occultations. He captured an occultation of asteroid 39249-2000YR88 on April 12th, early in the morning at 4.45 a.m. The duration was 3.2 seconds. On April 15th, he had a seven second hit with asteroid 238 Hypatia. The Allsky camera has not been working since April 11th. Our camera is working, but the manufacturer's software that updates their website is not reading our data. It's also not reading data for any of the other customers. We don't know if it will be repaired or if we will have to update to different software or a different camera. On the observatory grounds, the grass is growing and most of the trees and bushes have buds. I mowed the lawn for the first time this season on April 16th. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Bob. Big round of applause, Rob. <laughs> and let's go back here. For anybody that's still interested and doesn't completely hate this year, we do have calendars still available that we're happy to mail you or uh, throw at you from some distance. Um, I don't know if Alex wants to do a treasury report. There's really not much to report. We had a few renewals and we're just kind of coasting. So Alex, you want to just shake your head if you want to do it or not? <laughs> That's pretty much it. Just uh, you know, thanking those members even during this lull time uh, who are continuing to renew and provide us the support that uh, we need to keep our operations running. Uh, as you heard from Bob, we're continuing to keep you know the facility open, uh, you know, uh, you know, and and at least you know, controlled, uh, you know, and maintained and secure. And uh, we're looking forward to you know being able to provide live services again as soon as uh, we possibly can. So again, thanks to all of our members and uh, other supporters. Thank you. So moving on to photos. Uh, this is Zane's new 14.7 inch F 2.89 Dobsonian, which is ridiculously short and fast and still huge and apparently performs great. Uh, he's got some comparison images that are in our newsletter if you want to check that out. Um, and he got a lot of publicity on this. It was in a Spanish magazine. It was uh, top of mine on Reddit and for a while boosted our own website traffic. So good job there, Zane. Uh, this is Martin Hamar's image of asteroid 1998-OR2, uh, which is about uh, up to two and a half kilometers wide and will come very close to Earth, relatively speaking. Um, the closest approach next Wednesday. So this is actually a really good shot with that size telescope of an object that small. And this is Michael Southam's image of a quasar. So that dot in the center is a lot bigger than a normal star. This is a huge galaxy, uh, 2.4 billion light years away. So that's some old light. And Michael Southam also got the comet that's currently falling apart. Atlas Y4. So we got it while it's still around. Steve Labkoff's been busy. He got the Whirlpool Galaxy here with his uh, 92 millimeter refractor. And a fantastic shot of the Jellyfish Nebula after many tries. Uh, this one's hard to capture, it's very dim and it's really hard to process. I helped him out with that too. But great shot there. Steve also got star trails over the observatory. Uh, this was the same day that we installed the edge, 14 inch edge telescope. 
uh, I think it was the 26th. And you can see there's a lot of plane traffic. We don't have that anymore. Uh, shot of the moon off the 14 inch. This was, this was with his Nikon camera. And I think it was a four panel mosaic. Um, he got the Sombrero Galaxy. And you can see some of the little speckles that are above and below the plane of the galaxy are globular clusters. Uh, this is one that he put together from multiple nights. I showed him how to combine data from different sessions. So he's been playing around with that with the Andromeda Galaxy. And this is Dana Weisbrot has been busy. He got the International Space Station three times this month. Um, the first one there on the left, he captured with a uh, nine and a quarter Celestron that was just loose on the mount. So he was just aiming it manually with uh, sort of like a Dobsonian. And then the one on the right, he was holding an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain on his shoulder like a bazooka and just following it with a red dot finder and firing away. Um, he took thousands of shots and only got something like 49 in the field. But look at the detail on that. You can see the panels real clearly. You can see the progress module on it. Um, he also got a video of the space station going past Venus, which I didn't put here because it's on our newsletter if you want to go check it out. Also very cool. Amazing. Isn't that neat? We're waiting for it to go over the 14-inch uh, telescope with a lunar transit or something we can get. Um, Dan also got the Whirlpool. I think everybody did this month. We were all working on towards the Whirlpool. Uh, this is my shot of M81. If you recall, if you saw last month, I got M82. So this was going to be my next target since I got to get the pair. Uh, came out really nice. Uh, Crab Nebula. When we had the 16 inch, I was always testing it on the crab to see if I could get a little more detail. So that was my test for sharpness. So I did a similar test on the 14 inch. It's way better than the 16 ever was. Uh, and you can actually get a sense from the edges of the feathered edges that it's an explosion here. Uh, I mentioned Dana got a shot of the space station going past Venus. I did two, but I didn't take videos. I took still shots. This is uh, five of them. And then at, right after it passed, I quickly switched to a lower ISO so I could get Venus without all the glare. So um, not as detailed as Dana's best ISS shots, but you can still see the panels here. Kind of cool. Uh, I also got the Comet, like Michael Southam. Uh, mine was a little earlier in the month, I think. So it was pretty bright. And this was off the 14 inch edge. Uh, this was a very high resolution mosaic of the moon. I think it was five or six shots, uh, maybe more than that, off the 14 inch. And I took off the focal reducer. So this is the full resolution of my camera plus the telescope without any focal reducer. And the details are amazing on this. You can actually pick out Armstrong Crater in the high res versions. Like I said, everybody shot the Whirlpool, and I, and I did too. Um, this one's off the 14 inch edge. I uh, didn't get as many frames as I would have liked, but I'm certainly not complaining about the image. Also got the Sombrero. Um, after Steve Labkoff shot it, I figured I better shoot it too. Um, not totally happy with this one, but it is very cool. You can see a little bit of the um, details within the galaxy itself. Another shot of the moon. This was right before the full pink moon, the night before, because it was raining when we had full moon. Um, but I was gonna do another high resolution mosaic without the focal reducer. And uh, Kevin Green was using the telescope for occultation. So he got an occultation and like 10 minutes later, I got this and then took the camera off again. He got another occultation a few minutes after that. So we were playing musical telescope here. Uh, this is Galaxy NGC 4535, I think. 
Um, you can see it's a little grainy. I didn't get many frames, but the shape of it is really interesting. It's a nice little swirl. And the Owl Nebula off of Ursa Major. And as usual, Franco Fella comes through with some amazing star images of our own star. So we've got some cool prominences here. And the blue ring effect with prominences all the way around the edge. So it's nice that he's able to come up with something when the sun itself is blank. So he's finding something to look at instead of just a white circle. Uh, this one's especially cool. So if you get to our newsletter, uh, I think there might be a higher resolution version that you can click on. Future WAS events, if we have any. <laughs> um, some of these are might end up being virtual lectures like we're doing now. Hopefully we can get some um, somewhat distant uh, normality and have a barbecue again. Uh, Cherry, String, Cherry Springs Star Party may or may not be on. So we're just hoping to get back to something we can do. Uh, Stella Fame would be nice if that's still around. Future WAS events, the only really cool one is actually tonight. The Lyrid Meteor Shower peaks after midnight tonight. So uh, it's almost a new moon. So perfect timing. It's supposed to be clear. It was pouring here a few minutes ago, but now it's clearing up. So if you can stay awake and have a clear sky in your area, just look outside after midnight. Look for a, a large area of sky and just wait and see. And that concludes my part. So um, no breaks for anybody. We're going to bring up Moshe Guy. Dr. Moshe Guy is here to talk about stellar evolution. So take it away, sir. Okay. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, and uh, off we go. So, um, hello everybody. This is Moshe Guy, a member of uh, the WAS. I was actually drafted into this job. Uh, Dan asked me, uh, we had a cancellation, would you volunteer? Of course, with pleasure. Uh, what I would like to do today is uh, tell you a little bit on stellar evolution. There will be some overlap with uh, the previous talk that I gave three years ago. Uh, um, what I'd like to show is uh, uh, with the amazing uh, uh, accuracy that we can now study the cosmos all the way to the far, far end of the cosmos. Uh, of the observable cosmos with very high precision. And all of that is uh, uh, owing to our amazing uh, uh, development and uh, understanding of stellar evolution. Um, so here we are in the pillars of creation, ostensibly the number one online travel destination. Uh, ostensibly more people have seen this picture on the internet and any other, okay? Uh, I can believe it. I have myself contributed many times over to looking at this. I mean, you look over here, you see most likely star being born. All of this is ashes of uh, uh, dead stars. So you can see star, uh, you know, they are born, they are mature and they die. And this is what we call the theory of uh, stellar evolution and we will measure today we'll measure many things with stellar evolution we'll measure how hot they are we'll measure uh, uh, how old they are and of course we'll measure how far they are well if we start with stars why not start with the star next to us which uh, for some strange reason we give it a name we call it the sun but it's just another star uh, in my uh, presentation, the sun will be designated by a circle with a, a dot in the middle. That's the circle that we, uh, we use, the nomenclature we use for the sun. 
And I'm basically over here honoring uh, one of the greatest uh, astrophysicists of our time, John Bacall, uh, who uh, essentially developed the standard solar model. So here is the sun. You see uh, the, this new picture with unprecedented accuracy. Uh, and similarly, as you will see, unprecedented understanding of the sun. So the first question we'd like to ask, how far is the sun? Well, this question was asked 2000 years ago by the Greek. And the Greek's idea was the following. Let's observe the sun at the moon when the moon is in the first quarter, half moon. Okay, and let's see the angle that the moon uh, uh, rises above the horizon. So if we go over here, a ray that comes from the sun and reflect to the earth because it's half moon, by definition, this angle has to be right angle. So we have over here a right angle triangle. And we all know from geometry that the side divided by the hypotenuse is what's called cosine alpha. So if I measure uh, the angle, I know cosine alpha, then I know the ratio between the distance from the earth, uh, the earth to the sun, which we call astronomical unit, and the distance uh, from the earth to the moon. The Greek knew the distance from the earth to the moon. You can ask me how. It's a very simple exercise. Uh, well, there lies our problem. This angle that we, see, that we have to measure over here is highly exaggerated. The moon is not here. In fact, the moon is over here, almost at 90 degrees. So the angle that we have to measure is about one eighth of a degree less than uh, 90 degrees. And the Greek realized uh, this is half a degree uh, substandard by the sun, half a degree by the moon. They cannot do it. They didn't know another, another thing, that when we see the sun in the horizon right here, in fact, the sun is below the horizon because the uh, rays from the sun get refracted. They get bent in the atmosphere. So in fact, when we see the sun above the horizon, it is below the horizon. Well, the Greek were honest and we say the distance from the earth to the sun is 20 times the, uh, the distance from the Earth to the Moon. In fact, it's 400 times. So how do we know this distance? The Earth goes around the Sun, 365.25 is one year. This is the orbit of the Earth. Venus does the same thing, except that it goes in 225. So every once in a while, more than 100 years, Venus will be between the Earth and the Sun. So an observer in the Northern Hemisphere, we see Venus traveling through the sun around here. And an observer from the Southern Hemisphere will see it traveling over here. So one observer will see it with a time duration, two hours and something, a few hours and something. And another observer will see it slightly smaller and there will be a difference in the distance. So if we're smart, maybe we should be able to find the distance from the Earth to the Sun, which we call one astronomical unit. So here is Venus going across the Sun. And this is exactly what happened in 1769. Captain Cook sailed to Tahiti. And uh, well, 1769, remember the, uh, well, you won't remember, but you might know that <clears throat> uh, just, uh, uh, a decade before, a few decades, we would just manage to uh, 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 <clears throat> map the globe. The British Longitude Act has passed. We now know where Tahiti is. We know where the uh, Greenwich uh, Observatory in London is. We know the distance between Tahiti and the Greenwich Observatory happened to be 5,000 kilometers. So Captain Cook, now he has the clock, Harrison Clark, H4, the one that you can take on a boat, you can actually measure with high accuracy. Now, Cook is here in the Southern Hemisphere, so he measures this time difference. Here on the observatory in Greenwich in London, they measure this time difference. And let's see what we can do with this. If you notice, we have over here a triangle and we have another triangle, so let's expand it. D1 is the distance between uh, uh, 
Captain Cook and the observatory in London. X1 is the distance between the Earth and Venus. X2 is the radius of the orbit of Venus. That's the orbit of Venus, that's X2. And D2 is this distance. So we immediately know, and this is very good for some high school kids, let's do this exercise. You have a triangle over here and a triangle over here. These two triangles were known already by Euclidus. They are similar triangle. Similar triangle obey the following rule. The ratio of X2 to X1 is the ratio of D2 to D1. D1 over X1 is D2 over X2. Then we write X1 plus X2, that's X1 plus X2, that's one astronomical unit. That's, a, that's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. X2, on the other hand, that's the orbit of Venus, is related to the radius of the Earth by Kepler law, Kepler law number three. The relationship between the orbit of Venus and the orbit of Earth is given by the time that Venus takes to go around the Sun, a year of Venus, versus a year of the, sun, the Earth to the power two third. So we have here three equation. We have X1, X2, and one astronomical unit, three unknown. Well, what about this ratio? D1 we know is 5,000 kilometer. D2 is a very interesting function and I encourage some of you young people to actually calculate it. It's a function of delta T1, delta T2, the, uh, the orbital velocity of Venus and the radius of the sun. The radius of the sun, we all know, is one astronomical unit times the viewing angle of the sun, 0.5 degree. I change it to radian, I get the radius. Orbital velocity of Venus is two pi times the radius of the orbit of Venus divided by the time. So again, this is just including one astronomical unit. So we have three equations, three unknown. We solve for it or we find the distance from the Earth to the sun one astronomical unit and 149.5 million kilometers. Having known that and known that the viewing angle of the sun is 0.5 degree, uh, <clears throat> then we can calculate the diameter of the sun, 1.3 million kilometers. Absolutely incredible. 1769, humanity actually managed to measure the distance from the earth to the sun and the, how large is the sun the first star that we would like to understand. Well, what else can we study about the sun? We know the sun is yellow. And we all know that if we put our hand against the stove, the stove is red, it's hot. But if we put our hand against the, the, the uh, uh, acetylene uh, torch, if you make creme brulee, you have an acetylene torch, you all know it's quite hot. It's blue, it's hotter. The laws of physics allows us to relate the color of an object to its temperature. And how do we do that? The laws of physics dictate that a body of a certain temperature behave like what we call a black body. That is a black body which is mainly radiating in the blue. This is the spectrum of a black body which is mainly radiating in the red etc. Cetera, et cetera. Incidentally, just for the interested uh, people, classical physics have predicted that this will go all the way up there. The fact that it has come down here has been, has led to the greatest discovery of the 20th century called quantum mechanics. This black body radiation was a major issue and it only was solved by introducing of a constant we call Planck constant and later quantum mechanics. But that's a subject for another talk. Let's come back to relating the color to the temperature. We use here a law called Wind's law, which you all understand. There, there is a relationship between the color and the temperature. Again, looking at your stove, it's red. Looking at your acetylene torch, it's blue, it's hotter. Wind's law. Wind's law tells us the following. The temperature of the object, if it's a black body, it's 2.898 times 10 to the sixth Kelvin nanometer. Nanometer is a measure of a length. The wavelength 
the maximum wave, wavelength is measured in nanometer. For the sun, it happens to be yellow. So it's about 5,000 angstrom, or in fact, if we worked in the SI unit, System International, which we measure everything in meters. So that is nanometer. I get the central temperature of the sun to be, sorry, not the central, the surface temperature of the sun to be 5,778. So the surface of the sun is 5,778 Kelvin. But what about the center of the sun? You would like to know how hot it is in the middle of the sun. And here comes stellar evolution. Stellar evolution is the theory that tells us how the sun creates energy. What does the sun do? The sun takes four hydrogen atoms. Actually, in the sun, there's no atoms. The electron is stripped. So sometimes I'll call it hydrogen. Sometimes I'll call it proton, but it's the same thing. So we take four hydrogen and we make one helium. This is what we call hydrogen burning. In hydrogen burning, we make helium. Okay, so let's look at this. The sun must conserve and must obey by all the laws of physics. Okay, that's the assumption. So far, we found this assumption to be correct. Over here on the left side of the equation, we have four particles called protons. These particles are classified as baryons. Each proton is a baryon. Here we have four baryons. Here we have helium. It's two proton, two baryon, and two neutron, two baryon. Two plus two equal to four. Four baryon over here and four baryon over here. We conserved baryon number. Baryon number must be conserved. But look, we have a problem. We have a charge over here of plus four, four proton, and only two over here, charge of two plus. We have to conserve charge. In other words, we must emit two particles with positive charge. They cannot be baryon because baryon number is already conserved. They must be another family. That family is called lepton. We have to emit a positive lepton and a posi the negative uh, 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 lepton is the electron. The positive electron called positron will do. So now we conserve baryon number, we conserve charge, but we have another problem. We have a lepton number over here, which is two and zero over here. So we must emit a particle with a lepton number minus one. That particle is a neutrino. So the laws of physics require that the sun, if the sun is shining, then the sun must shine in neutrino. Wonderful result. What about energy? Energy has to be conserved. For energy to be conserved, I take the mass of the four hydrogen minus the mass of helium and the mass of the two positron that I emitted. I multiply it by C square, E equal to MC square, and I get energy in some unit, milli, mega electron volt, it doesn't matter. Energy is now balanced. It turns out that the neutrino energy is 0.25, and that's about a factor of 100. And we have two of them. So we, immediately the laws of physics tells us that if the sun is shining with a certain luminosity, the neutrino luminosity has to be 2.3% times the solar luminosity. Solar luminosity is something we know very well. Our life depends on it. The sun shines on us when we go to the beach with 1.37 kilowatts per meter square. All of us who have solar power know this very well. So that's over a meter square at, at one astronomical unit. But the sun shines into the entire sphere. So the area of a sphere is four pi r square with the radius being one astronomical unit. So from that, we immediately determine the solar luminosity, 3.9 times 10 to the 33 Earth. You may ask yourself, how much is it? Well, I may help you by telling you that Erg is the energy that a fly carries as it zooms around the house. When a fly flies and it bangs against the window, the energy that it gives to the, to the window is one Erg. Imagine 10 to the three, 33 flies banging into your window. 
you wouldn't want to be there. So we now know the solar neutrino flux with plus or minus 1% accuracy. The solar neutrino, we will designate by phi. Okay. Incredible. It's just mind boggling. You know, I have problem with finding a uh, radioactive source with accuracy of 1%, okay? Very hard to manufacture them. And we are talking about neutrinos coming from the sun with 1% accuracy. Well, maybe neutrino would allow us to study the sun. In fact, they do. For that, we need to understand how the sun creates energy. This is what we call solar fusion. Before I told you in general, the sun takes four hydrogen atoms and make helium. But let's see how it happened. Again, the hydrogen, I would sometimes designate as H or sometimes just as a proton. Helium, I'll sometimes designate by alpha, alpha particle. For historical reason, we call it alpha particle. So the first thing the sun does is take two hydrogen and make an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium and emit a neutrino. Then we, the sun make an isotope of helium called helium-3 and then makes helium-4. So eventually four hydrogen go to helium, positron and neutrino and energy. 86% of the time that's what the sun does. The rest 14% of the time the sun does is take helium-3, an isotope of helium, another isotope of helium, helium-4, the abundant one, the, the normal one that we call helium, and make from it a element called beryllium-7. Beryllium-7 is radioactive, decays with the mid neutrino, which I will call them now beryllium-7 neutrino. 0.01% of the time, the sun take beryllium-7, fuse it with the hydrogen, make boron-8, and boron-8 gives us neutrino. So now this is called the proton-proton chain, and it has three uh, sections. Proton-proton-1, PP-1, proton-proton-2, PP-2, and proton-proton-3. Here we have the neutrinos of the PP, neutrinos of beryllium-7, and neutrinium of uh, boron-8. Well, John Bacall, uh, the developer of the standard uh, uh, model of the sun, uh, one of the greatest uh, physicists, John Bacall one time told me that his father wanted him to be a rabbi. And I said, John, forget about being a rabbi. You wrote the Bible. The Bible of neutrino astrophysics uh, is something that every one of us, every beginner have to read is John Bacall. And John Bacall calculated where the energy in the sun coming from. Here I plot to you the radius in the sun, the fraction of the radius of the sun. So within 30% of the sun, all of the energy that emits by the sun is created. Most interesting are the boronate neutrino, which are at around four and a half percent. They are right in the middle of the sun. And John Bacall told us that he can calculate the boron neutrino flux dependent on the central temperature of the sun to the power 25. We know this with high precision. There is no wiggle room to change the central temperature of the sun. And it turns out to be 15.7 plus or minus 0.1 million Kelvin. Sub percent accuracy for an object which is 149.5 million kilometers away from us. And we are buried about half a million kilometer into the center of the sun absolutely mind boggling what humanity has accomplished. Well, it turns out, aside from being such a wonderful, marvelous uh, achievement, that this temperature is actually very important. Stars which are below 17 million degree Kelvin burn energies through what I told you just a minute ago, the proton-proton chain, the PP chain. 
when stars go to temperature larger than 17 million degree Kelvin, they go through the CN bicycle or what we call CNO cycle. Let's talk now about the next way that we burn hydrogen, burn hydrogen to make helium, the CN cycle. The CN cycle has been introduced by Hans Bethe in 1939, At the same time another person, uh, Heizsäcker has introduced that. In fact, we all know Hans Bethe, uh, again, one of a giant of our time, he got the Nobel Prize in 1967. Let's see what Hans Bethe suggested. Hans suggests, Hans, Professor Bethe suggested that should you have carbon in the star? Well, if you have carbon in the star, it's clearly not a first generation star. First generation star were made from the stuff that the Big Bang gave us. And the Big Bang gave us basically helium and hydrogen, 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. So it cannot be a first generation star. It has to be made from process material. So if we have carbon, carbon can then synthesize, make a nuclear synthesis with a proton and make a new element called nitrogen 13. That is Z equal to six, that's Z equal to seven on the Mendeleev table. That's an isotope of nitrogen. Nitrogen does nuclear decay, beta decay, and emitter neutrino and become carbon 13. Carbon 13 capture a proton and become an element called nitrogen 14. Another proton gives us oxygen 15. Oxygen 15, nuclear beta decay to nitrogen 15. Nitrogen 15 fuse with a proton and form an alpha particle. What a wonderful situation. We, we took one proton, we took another proton, third proton, fourth proton, and we make helium and back to carbon 12. So we can go through this cycle forever and ever. The carbon will remain what we call in chemistry a catalyzer. Four proton make helium. We burn four proton to make helium with the help of carbon. And, uh, uh, and that's it. That's how we make, uh, how we burn uh, hydrogen in, uh, uh, in star, which are hotter than the sun, 17 million degree Kelvin. Okay, so now we burn all the hydrogen. We need, we need to go to the next level, burn helium. Helium burning is the most, one of the most fascinating stories of stellar evolution. In 1954, a very smart person, Fred Hoyle, he was not just a physicist, he wrote an opera. He's the guy who discovered what the Stonehenge was for an extremely uh, uh, interesting fellow. And he said the following, well, if I take two helium, two alpha particle, I'll make beryllium eight, that's no good. Beryllium eight is unstable. I cannot make element. I have to make three alpha particles to come together. And that can only happen if there is a quantum mechanical state. Today, we call it the Hoyle state. In 1954, there was no state. Hoyle predicted, he said, I exist. I have carbon. There's plenty of carbon in the universe. There must be a state in carbon 12, a quantum mechanical state that would allow me to make a fusion of three alpha particles, three helium to make carbon 12. A year later, the state was discovered. And this is perhaps one of the most fascinating subject of uh, nuclear synthesis and stellar evolution. We owe our existence for this zero plus state. If that zero plus state did not exist, the universe will be just hydrogen and helium. There will be no coronavirus, but there will also none of us. There will be no carbon. Amazing, amazing discovery. And in fact, it, 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 it plays into this anthropogenic 
um, um, uh, projection of, of the universe. And what's the anthropogenic assumption says? The laws of physics are finely tuned that life can exist so we living object can study the laws of physics. Well, I don't know. The anthropogenic assumption. The whole state is the state that we exist because of that whole state, we can make carbon. That's the, the production in the helium burning uh, process of cell. Well, the same time they produce carbon, we also produce oxygen. We can capture helium, alpha particle on carbon and make oxygen 16. But now life becomes crazy. There is no state over here like the whole state. So we don't know this reaction. Imagine 40 years later, we don't know how fast this happened. Because we don't know how fast this happened, we don't know the result of helium burning is carbon and oxygen of an unknown ratio. This will turn out to be one of the major issues throughout my talk. In fact, I've been working on this problem for 25 years. In 1994, 1994 my graduate student received the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, best PhD thesis award from the American Physical Society. We thought we solved it, but then we realized we didn't. We'll come back to it. The carbon to oxygen ratio is a major question in stellar evolution. Okay, so now let's look on a 25 solar mass star. 25 solar mass star burn hydrogen, make helium. Burn helium, make carbon, carbon plus oxygen of unknown ratio then burn neon, and eventually it creates an iron core. Iron cannot be long, any longer burned. There is no nuclear energy produced by burning hydrogen. It costs energy to burn, sorry, to burn iron. So you may ask yourself, here is in this region, we produce energy, and we have about 20 solar mass of gra gravity pushing against it. What balance it? Of course, the energy we produce. The energy that we produce over here create outward pressure that balance gravity. But iron is no longer burned. There is no, nothing to balance gravity. What would balance gravity? What balance gravity is quantum mechanics. In here, in the core, there are electron. And you know the electron, they practice what do we call it? Uh, social uh, distancing. Electrons don't like to be on top of each other. They have to be separated. Quantum mechanics create a pressure that is, so here we have one solar masses, here 24 solar masses. The pressure of 24 solar masses on the iron core is balanced by the outward pressure of quantum mechanics. Electron, do not like to be on top of each other. They have social distancing. They keep apart. And therefore we have here outward pressure that we will come back to. Now let's take a look. We have here 25 solar masses. You may not see this very well, but this happens over 7 million years. Helium burning occurs over half a million years. Now remember, the sun burns hydrogen over 10 billion years, 25 solar masses burn hydrogen and go to helium burning after 7 million years. So bigger star burn faster and we'll come back to it. And let me tell you an interesting story. This figure was done by Hans Bader and my teacher, Jerry Brown, and was published in Scientific American in 1985. Guess what? I discovered that this temp temperature scale, they made a mistake. They made a mistake by a factor of 10. Go figure, how do you get, how do you tell a Nobel Prize, the giant of our time, Hans Bader? How do you tell Hans Bader, excuse me, professor, I think you made a mistake by a factor of 10. Well, 
it takes an Israeli with guts, and I did it. So if you go to Scientific American, correct this scale that they have by a factor of 10. Okay, very good. Now that we have all the stellar evolution in hand, we can start looking at stars. And now we go back to the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 19, uh, 20th century uh, to the Harvard Observatory to Mr. Charles Pickering. Charles Pickering had a zoo of astronomers, I mean, and they did everything that we know today. It all comes from there. They start classifying stars. They didn't know what stars are, but they start classifying. So they classify them by, by, by color. O, B, A, fine, and I will not continue because uh, it's, no longer, it's no longer PC to sing the song that I used to sing when I was a kid. So there's O star, B star, A star, F star, G star, K star, M star, classified. They were classified by the color. Then we also look on something called the bolometric magnitude. What is the magnitude of the star? Magnitude is the same unit that Aristotle used 2000 years ago. Remember the uh, Greek was thinking that the earth is in the center, the sun moves around it, the moon's around it, and then they classified the stars. The brightest stars was magnitude one, the weakest that the eye can see is six. So between magnitude one and magnitude six, there's a factor of 100. So two and a half, <clears throat> two and a half magnitude happens to be here. So we are going to use magnitude throughout the talk, but that's basically the luminosity. How bright is the star? So let's take a look on a globular cluster called M5. Okay, we already heard something today about globular cluster. <clears throat> globular cluster, there's a incredible amount of stars over here, wonderful work that could be done, hundreds of thousands of stars. And you can see some of them are bright, some of them are dim. Magnitude will be small, magnitude will be large. Large magnitude is dimmer. Some of them are yellow, some of them are blue, and some of them are red. So I can now classify stars by their color. And for th those of you who are expert, I, I take the blue magnitude minus the, the visual magnitude, and that's what I plot over here. But you need not be concerned with this. I'm plotting over here the temperature, surface temperature of the sun, of the stars in the globular cluster. So the globular, globular cluster, M5, we have good reason to believe that all these stars are of the same age and they are basically packed together at the same distance from us, okay? Pretty much uh, same, same age and pretty much same distance. We'll come back to this. So now I simply plot this luminosity, this magnitude, and this temperature. And I see wonderful arrangement of stars. So originally that's what they saw in Charles Pickering uh, 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 Observatory. They saw stars lying on this line, which we call the main sequence, like our sun. They saw stars over here, which we call the red giant. And then there is stars over here, which are called super giant. And here, the white dwarf star. So what are they? Let's go to our M5. And here is the M5. So we are walking along, oh, sorry, I have to tell you one more thing. It turns out to be that the luminosity of the star is proportional to the mass, roughly to the power of four. So if you have a, a star which is twice as heavy, it's two to the power of four more luminous, 16 times more luminous. Important, it will come back. So here we are in M5, we have plot the, the diagram. We call this Hertzsprung russell diagram. Two people who worked in Charles Pickering Observatory in Harvard. And now we, turn, we plot the Hertzsprung russell diagram for M5. And here we have some star lying along what we call the main sequence. 
it turns out main sequence star burn hydrogen. Remember the hydrogen burning. Those stars are actually not above 17 million degree Kelvin, so they use the PP chain. Stars over here are smaller masses than stars over here. They are all of the same age, but the stars over here burn hydrogen faster. When we get to this point, in the center of the star, we have a hydrogen core, a helium core, I'm sorry, helium core. The helium is heavy. The helium is compressed. The temperature of the core rises. Hydrogen burning becomes faster. Consequently, the star expands. The envelope burning of the hydrogen make the star expand. If the star expands, it cools down. It becomes redder, okay? For example, the sun at the end of its life will expand and will include the earth. The radius of the sun will be more than one astronomical unit. And the sun will not be yellow, will be red, it will be about 3000 degrees. So the sun expands over here because of the theory of stellar evolution tells us that in the center of the sun, there is a hotter center made out of helium and the envelope is now burning hydrogen faster, so it expands. Eventually, helium burning start, and here we have the red giant which burn helium when we burn helium, the luminosity goes up. Remember, the luminosity goes up here. The red color is here. Those are the red giant. Uh, then at, at, for a certain stage, uh, we will have the HGB star, and here we'll have the horizontal branch stars. Eventually, the star will go down here and become white dwarf, which we don't see in this uh, M5. The stars over here are beyond the helium burning, and in particular, very interesting group are the one called the RR Lyra. So here, I, if you will excuse me for the sake of completeness, I will repeat some of the things that I said three years ago, but maybe you forgot, so that's all right. Let's take a look on the RR Lyra star. Oh, before we do that, I'm sorry. So here we have, the, uh, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. What can we learn from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? Remember, I told you the stars over here are smaller mass than the stars over here. So this takes the time burning hydrogen and these burn hydrogen in a hurry. So they get to the stage in which the expansion to red giant occurs in uh, <clears throat> faster, okay? So, by studying the shape of this uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and by understanding, remember I told you, 25 solar masses star burn hydrogen in about 7 million years, but the sun, which is one solar mass by, the, by definition, uh, takes 10 billion years. So we, we have the stellar evolution allows us to, to say how long it takes for the star to get to that branch. And it turns out to be that if you try to calculate uh, the, those curves with the assumption of how old are these stars, they are all the same age, but this one is burning faster because it's slightly heavier. And here is the curve for 12, sorry, for 10, here's a curve for 12, and here's a curve for 14. So my colleague at Yale, Pierre Dimarc, in the 1990s said, well, my conclusion that the stars in the globular cluster M5 are somewhere around 12 billion years old, plus or minus 2 billion years old. Incredible, incredible achievement. We measure the age of a star by understanding it's stellar evolution. Stellar evolution allows us to measure the age of the star. But in the 1990s, we had a problem. Pierre de Marc told us that the globular cluster is probably 12 billion years plus or minus two. 
But at that time, people, well, they claim they knew, but now we think they believe that the universe was eight billion years. So some people measure the age of the universe and say it's eight billion years and come here the mark and I say, my star, the globular cluster are 12 billion years. How can you have a star which is older than the universe? A daughter cannot be older than her mother. She might stand up and shout, I'm older, but she cannot be older than her mother. A star cannot be older than the universe. Well, we had a problem. Turns out to be that Pierre de Marc was correct. The age of the universe as we know it today is not 8 billion, is 13.7 billion. Also, we know it with fantastic accuracy, as we will see later again due to stellar evolution. So, those stars in the globular cluster were probably produced right after the Big Bang. One billion years, who knows? Maybe later. We know today that stellar formation started after the Big Bang at about 350 million years, 0.35 million years. Okay, very good. Coming back to our, our, our Lyra, and again, this I will do very quick. I'm looking at the clock and uh, uh, somebody could tell me, I think uh, according to my clock, I have about what, 15 minutes? Uh, maybe somebody can send me a chat. Uh, just to calibrate me. I, I assume that I have 15 minutes. Anyhow, I'll try to finish. So, Ira and Lyra are stars uh, <clears throat> uh, which um, uh, <clears throat> has. Uh, uh, did I see two more minutes? I saw a chat. Oh, you, you can go for 15 minutes if. if... 15 minutes, okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, are, we are doing fine. Uh, Ira and Lyra are a very interesting star. Those are the star that was sitting over here. These are the Ira and Lyra. They become bright in a matter of hours. The, the scales over here is the scales of two days. In a matter of hours, they become bright, and we know exactly how much the brighter they get. One magnitude, factor of 2.5. Okay, and then they come down and again and go up and come down, go up and come down. So we know exactly how much light they produce. If we measure how much light arrive at us, we measure distance. So by measuring our, our Lyra uh, stars, we can measure distances. So imagine that out here in the M5 globular cluster, there's one, two or three R R Lyra. So we know where the globular cluster is. Okay. So, we're now sitting over here uh, in the solar system on Earth, and we know the distance to all this globular cluster, okay? The globular cluster, believe it or not, actually move across the sky. They move with a motion we call proper motion. Stars evolve around our galaxy with about 200, every 200 million years, they make one rotation. So we can measure, let's say, we measure today the position, we come 30 years, 50 years later, and we see it move, not by much, a fraction of an arc second, but we can get the proper motion. We can also measure the radial uh, velocity, this we do with the effect called Doppler effect. From that we get, this is the vector sum, we get the peculiar motion. So now for each one of these dot globular cluster, we know its position and we know where it's heading. And exactly 100 years ago, there was a major debate. The results have shown that we are not in the center of the galaxy. All of these globular clusters are moving around the center of the galaxy and we are about two thirds of the way out. This also allows us to measure the size of the uh, <clears throat> solar uh, of the uh, Milky Way of our galaxy, and that's about 100,000 light year. A light year is the distance that light travel in one year. So light goes from here to here, will take 100,000 years to go. 
So we now know that the globular cluster are moving around the center of the galaxy and we are not there. So first of all, shame on you, Caltech physicists, they really insisted, but they lost. It was exactly a hundred years ago that this was a hot topic. Okay. I say, thank God we are not in the center of the galaxy. Here is the picture of our Milky Way. I repeat, human being took a picture of our galaxy. Just imagine, this was done by a satellite called COVID. You can ask me later, how do you take a picture of your galaxy? I mean, you can not have a, a selfie stick that goes out of the galaxy and take a picture of the galaxy. How do you do that? Our solar system is somewhere over here. In the middle of our galaxy, the Milky Way, there uh, is a black hole, 4.2 million solar masses is known as Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star, if you are in March in Venezuela, it's straight up above your head. For us, it's just above the horizon, maybe up to 30 degrees in the southern sky, the center of our galaxy. Sagittarius A star. How do we know that there is a black hole over there? First of all, we see lots of X-ray, lots of energy emitted from the center of the galaxy. But believe it or not, we actually able to take the orbits of each one of these stars. And there's about a dozen of them for which we are able to take the orbit. Now, remember, we don't have to wait 200 million years for them to go around the black hole. They do it much, much faster. So in, in, a, in a lifetime of a graduate student, you can actually uh, <clears throat> map out some of these orbits. And from these orbits, you can calculate what is the uh, mass of the black hole. Wonderful. So now we want to go beyond our galaxy. Okay. To go beyond our galaxy, remember there are our Lyra, our stars, which are just slightly more <clears throat> massive than the sun, slightly more uh, bright than the sun. Our, our Lyra will fade away when we leave the galaxy. We need new stars. And these are called the Cepheid variable star. They're about five to 20 times solar masses. And they, again, they have an oscillatory behavior. They are dim, bright, dim, bright, dim, bright. And the beauty of this is if we measure the period of this brightness, it directly relates to the energy that this star emit, the luminosity. So if we know the period of oscillation, we go to this calibration curve, okay? Let's say 10, 10 days period. We go to this calibration and say, okay, it should be as luminous as 3000 times the sun. We measure our, uh, the, the magnitude, the luminosity that we see, and we get the distance. Further away object are dimmer. This is how we measure distances. And in fact, this is exactly what was done. But here comes a very interesting story. Here I must uh, thank Shannon for giving me this beautiful picture, mine was not such a great resolution. Notice in this picture, hard working people. They happen to be all women. Here, on, thanks to Shannon, I can now read the age, uh, the date, December 1889. And here is the variability of the star. As the story goes, Mr. Pickering, the lady who took care of his house said to him, you know, Mr. Pickering, I think you should hire women. You know, women are very good. They can do math. They are very pedantic. They keep track of things. And you know what, Mr. Pickering? For the price of one man, you can get 10 women. Remember, this is the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Women did not have the right to vote. The women who actually got a job were very happy. So today, looking back, we call this the Pickering era. All of these people, in fact, women, which we 
way they call computers. Okay? When you think on the first computer, you probably think of ENIAC, UNIVAC. Uh, if you are a little bit more knowledgeable, you may think about the Turing machine. But in fact, the first computers were human beings, were women that calculated in Mr. Pickering's all the various things that we know today about star, all the classification, O, B, et cetera, the Hertz point Russell, all came from the hard work of what we call today, ironically, Pickering, Heron, all the people that were now called computers. So remember, the first computer was a woman, not ENIAC and not UNIVAC. My favorite computer is Henrietta Levitt. Amazing, amazing astronomer, probably the best astronomer that ever walked this earth. Henrietta Levitt graduated from Oberlin College. She became sick. She lost her earring. She was deaf. She could work just Henrietta Levitt and her data, data. And she's the one who created this calibration curve. And she's the one who gave Hubble this calibration curve. She died in 1921, very young age. What Hubble did? Hubble looked on the galaxy in Andromeda. This is not the galaxy in Andromeda. M31 is the galaxy in Andromeda. It's about 2.5 million light year away. This is another galaxy about 10 times further. But this galaxy is better to show because you see it head on. Andromeda, you see from the sun. So Hubble looked on this star. Say, so, okay, it's now bright and dim, bright and dim. Went back to Henrietta Levitt calibration curve, says, well, I am here with a period. The star should be that bright, but I measure its brightness in my telescope. And Hubble, to his surprise, say, well, that star is two million light years away from me. He already knew the, solar, the Milky Way is 100,000 light year across. So that means there is a galaxy outside of the Milky Way. The age of cosmology started. Hubble's main, most important discovery was to discover a galaxy outside of the Milky Way. And guess what? You would never hear about Hubble if he couldn't get this calibration curve from Henrietta Levitt. She is my hero. She should be your hero too. Okay, now in the last five minutes, we want to go beyond our next whole galaxy. We want to measure distances to the end of the universe. Well, CFID variable can take us to about 500 million light year. And then they run out of woof. They simply are not bright enough. We need something brighter. And that is what we call supernova. What is a supernova? Again, originally we just classified. We had supernova, which did not show any hydrogen. We call them type one. We had supernova, which are show, showed hydrogen. We call them type two. If there was silicon, we call them type 1A. So type 1A and type two, are the two supernova that I would like to discuss in terms of stellar evolution. Let's start with type two. Remember our 25 solar masses reach to a point where it has over here in the middle one solar masses of iron, and that iron create a pressure outward due to quantum mechanics. It does not collapse due to quantum mechanics, but that can go only so far. When the iron core become 1.4 solar masses, it comes to a limit we call the Chandra Shaker limit, in which case even quantum mechanics gives up, says I can't take it anymore. They're all pressuring against me, I'm collapsing. At 1.4 solar masses, the iron core will explode, will implode under its own gravity. Or the proton in here, will become neutron and we will emanate an incredible amount of neutrinos. For 10 seconds in here, there will be a neutrino bubble and those neutrino will push outward and create the type two supernova. 
What's a type 1a? A the type 1a comes from binary star system in which in one case we have white dwarf and next to it we have a red giant and the white dwarf is stealing hydrogen. Okay, so we have white dwarf, one solar masses, that's where the sun will end up. We steal hydrogen from the red giant. We grow, as we grow, we make a nickel a core, and eventually we get to 1.4 solar masses, the Chandra Shaker limit, and the star collapse in what we call thermonuclear ex explosion. Of course, you see over here, there's only nickel, silicon, and carbon, no hydrogen, but we have silicon line. That's why it is type 1a. You may ask yourself, how do we know all of this? Here it is. We saw a type 1a supernova. We know that in this location, there was a white dwarf, but unfortunately, we haven't seen the red giant comp companion. But the red giant companion has to be there. How will the white wolf all of a sudden explode? It has to get some material from somewhere. So it looks pretty good that our theory works pretty well. In this thermonuclear explosion, we have about 4 billion solar masses explosion. In other words, the amount of light that comes out is like four billion suns, like an entire galaxy. So if we have a galaxy at the end of the universe and we look at it and all of a sudden it's brighter, there's gotta be a supernova in there, okay? Uh, the, all the stars in the galaxy cannot all decide in the same time to become twice as, uh, as bright. So if the, if the galaxy out there at the end of the universe is at a certain magnitude and then it goes twice as bright, you know a supernova. And in principle, you know it is 1.4 solar masses. So you know exactly how much energy comes out. Again, you have a calibrated source and you can measure distances. Okay, there's some few nice stories over here. Here's Tycho Bra. Here's what the Koreans saw. I skip all the stories, let's get to the science. So in principle, you say, I have a 1.4 solar masses explosion. I know exactly how much energy is produced. I know the luminosity. Not so fast. It turned out that the luminosity is almost the same, but not quite the same. A factor of two different. Well, a factor of two is no good. We don't want to measure distances to the square root of, of, of two. We want to measure it with higher. In 1993, Mr. Phillips, or Professor Phillips, came up with the following idea. If I stretch this curve upward and to the left and to the right by the same stretching factor, I get all this, these are called light curve. I get all this light curve to sit on one calibration curve. So now I know the amount of energy coming out from a type 1a supernova. Instead, within a factor of two, I know it is an accuracy of 8%. I can measure distances to the end of the observable universe with 8% accuracy. Incredible. Humanity has achieved that. So this is my last slide. What do we do? We measure type 1a supernova in our immediate vicinity, within 500 million light years. That's also the place where the Cepheid variable appears. And they all lie, so when we, and, and we plot their luminosity, so the one closer are more luminous, the one further away are less luminous. And they all lie on a perfect straight line. Yeah. Perfect straight line. And now we extend this straight line to five billion light year away. These are supernova that exploded five billion years ago. There are five billion, they're about one third of the way out to the edge of the observable universe. And all of these supernova are slightly dimmer. 
If they are slightly dimmer, that means that they are slightly further away from where you would expect them to be. So if these galaxies are going the expansion, the expansion of the universe, five billion years ago, that expansion received an extra kick. It was an accelerated expansion. That's little deviation. You may think it's insignificant, but it's probably one of the most important discoveries of the last century. It was so important that in 2011, it got the Nobel Prize. And in fact, it now tells us that we basically have a major problem at hand. Why are these supernova all of a sudden getting an extra kick? We have no idea why. Well, if you don't know what you're doing, give it a name and sound intelligent. We call it dark energy. The universe is full of 70, 73% of the energy in the universe is dark energy. We have no idea what it is. In addition, there's another, another issue in, in, in our little universe, and that is dark matter. 23% of the universe is dark matter. So here we are today. April 21st, 2020, I checked the web before, before I started the talk, there's no news. So this is as the universe as we know it, April 21st, 2020, unless something happened during my talk, this is what we know today. 23% of the universe is dark matter, 73% is dark energy. We have no idea what dark matter is. We have no idea what dark energy is. Only thing we know, the normal matter from which we are built is only 4% of the universe. And the observed stars are about 1%. So on this wonderfully optimistic, this is the best thing that can happen to mankind. We have a lot to do, a lot ahead of us. And I only hope that I will be alive when we will find out the solution to this question. What on earth is dark matter? Or what on the universe is dark matter? And what is dark energy? And on that note, I want to just send you all of you, my friends in Fairfield County in Westport. We read about you in the paper. We know what's happening. Please stay safe. Stay at home. Be safe and healthy. And thank you. Thank you. Alex, do you know if we have any questions in chat? Yeah, Shannon, we have one. Uh, it's from Dan. Uh, the question is, why or how do neutrinos arrive before the light of a supernova? OK, very good question. I think I might know the answer to that one. <laughs> Go ahead. Give it a try. I, I think it's because the light takes a while to get out of the supernova, but the neutrinos pass right through. Precisely. So uh, let's go back. L let's go to type two supernova. It's easier to understand with type two supernova. Remember, this is where the neutrinos are produced. The neutrinos have to travel through all this dust around here. OK, so look at the light curve. Uh, so what's the light curve? Uh, light curve. So this is the how bright the supernova become. And it takes the supernova a, a good two weeks to become bright. Uh, because the light has to, uh, well, the light is trapped in, as, as the light travels through the dust, uh, <laughs> It creates ionization. It creates a lot of a lot of physical phenomena, and the the brightness of the supernova build up. It also then stored in the supernova. Remember, the supernova occurred over here, but four hundred days later, we still see the light simmering out. Now, here there is another phenomena that takes place. Remember, I told you the center of the supernova, 60% is nickel 56. 
So the shining over here is all due to the nuclear decay of nickel 56. 56. This is what we call lifetime, okay? That's the lifetime of uh, nickel 56. Okay, it's about 112 days. Uh, so that's the shining of this curve. Over here is precisely as Shannon said, the light is trapped and is traveling out and it takes more time. Light doesn't travel in a straight, it goes and it zig and zag and zig and zag and eventually comes out. For example, light which is produced in the center of the sun take 10,000 years to get to the surface in the, in the world of physics. Light is a photon. A photon which is produced in the center of the sun take 10,000 years to get through the sun and get to the surface. The neutrinos are doing it literally in a split second. The neutrinos move at the speed of light. Good I've question. heard that before. How do we know it's 10,000 years? Ah, remember the guy who wrote the Bible? You just ask him. Ask Moses? <laughs> this is what we call this is what we call stellar evolution. This is a lifetime work of Mr. John Bacall. By the way, John Bacall, another thing he did is he gave us the Hubble. Some people think that the Hubble telescope should have been called the John Bacall. It's not a very well known thing. But anyhow, so John Bacall created, started in 1965, uh, worked on the standard solar model. Uh, and brought it to such accuracy that in 2005, he was not alive. He would have gotten the Nobel Prize. But in, so 1964 to 2005, 50 years later, the standard solar model was so accurate that we can use the sun as a source of neutrino to study neutrino. And that's what uh, my friend uh, uh, Art McDonald got the Nobel Prize in 2005. So, Short answer to, to your question is we asked John Bacall. John Bacall look on his uh, standard solar, uh, solar model and it's all in his book. If you want to read it, it's all, it's all described there. Uh, and that's the result of the model. It makes sense. So short answer we know because there are equations with lots of numbers and characters and Greek letters in them. I don't know if lots of equation. I think there is a very powerful computer that uh, calculates this. Okay. Anything else? I've got no other questions. I just put out one more uh, last chance to for everybody. So let's give them a, a few seconds, and if not, we'll we'll call it an evening. Maybe they want to hear. While we're waiting, uh, if anybody. Uh, has a chance, make sure you go out tonight and watch the Lyrids. It's quiet. No more, no new questions. Okay. Well, we, we had a pretty good audience. I, I heard at some point some 50 something. Yes. I think yeah, more than 50 folks. I think it's... Uh, that would be a busy night in the classroom. <laughs> All right, okay. let's call that a wrap. Thank okay. you very much, Moshe. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you uh, hopefully not online in a month, but probably online. All right. And Cal, hopefully we can get to see some meteors, meteorites soon. Uh, at this rate, I would expect some to fall on our heads. Yes, that's the hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, good night, everyone. Night. Go watch your Lyrids. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Okay. Stay safe. Setting it up, Alex. <laughs>